Hello, and welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm your producer and occasional host, Caroline Roberts. On this week's episode, Acton's co founder and president, Reverend Robert Sirico, and Acton's associate researcher, Dan Huger, are going to dive into the topic of socialism, specifically how it's played out in Nicaragua and Venezuela. After that, on the second segment of this episode, I decided to run a Redux recording, a segment that we actually released on the podcast about seven months ago now. Last year, Acton was privileged to work with a great group of interns, and Noah Gold, a student at my alma mater, Grove City College, produced a great recording for us, in which he spoke with a Venezuelan dissident, Javier Avila, about inflation and unrest in Venezuela. This has probably been one of my favorite segments we've ever released on this podcast, and I thought it paired nicely with the first segment. If you like this podcast and you're looking for any reading materials on the topics, check out our show notes. Every Wednesday when we release a podcast episode, I publish a list of reading materials, videos, or more that go along with each episode, and you can read them all at blog.acton.org. So if you're listening to our show in the car during your morning commute and can't write down book or article titles at that moment, we'll link them all in our show notes for you. And of course, before we jump into the show, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play. We're on pretty much every podcast app or directory you can think of. And as always, please leave us a review and rating on iTunes. Welcome. Uh, This is Dan Huger. I am the uh, librarian and research associate here at Acton, and I am with the president and co-founder of the Acton Institute, Father Robert Sirico. Today we're going to be talking about the evolving sort of situation in Nicaragua and Venezuela. There's a social and economic crisis in both countries that's been increasingly dire and spiraling out of control. Father Robert, why do you pay such particularly close attention to these corners of the world? Is there a personal connection for you? Well, it's interesting. A lot of people don't know the founding of the Acton Institute, the ideas I had going back into the 80s. But when I finally uh, worked with Chris Maurin to actually structurally, institutionally begin the Acton Institute, I was in um, Guatemala attending a meeting in 1990 of the Mount Pelerin Society in the little town of Antigua, Guatemala. And it was there that I was walking along the cobblestone streets of that colonial town Mm -hmm. that I met and spoke with Alex Schaufwen. Alex has been a board member of the Acton Institute from that time to this and is now on our staff, actually. But when I talked to him about the idea of the Institute, I thought all I needed was a research assistant. And he encouraged me to think bigger to think of cloning myself and, uh, <laughs> in effect, my, my intellectual yeah. experience of how I had come from the left. So I always say that the Acton Institute was born on the streets of Guatemala. So ever since then, I've been very interested. And I also think that that part of the world, Central America and more broadly uh, Latin America, is instructive because there have been so many instances of what does not work. Uh, especially in the name of Marxism and uh, socialism and various kinds of dictatorial um, and authoritarian regimes down there. Very early on in the history of the Institute, I went to uh, not only Guatemala but Nicaragua. Uh, When I was invited to Guatemala, I had wanted to go to uh, to, um, El Salvador, Mm -hmm. but the assassination uh, by the paramilitary or by the military Uh, in Salvador of the Jesuit priests prevented me from going because the organizers were afraid that they would retaliate with a priest they saw on the opposite side, that the left would do that. And so naturally it kind of riveted my attention to the whole area. And then the rise of the Sandinistas in Nicaragua where I went and visited several times. It just kind of builds, you know, your, your familiarity with the area of the country, uh, your familiarity with the people, and all of the political trends has kept me interested. And Venezuela, of course, you know, uh, in those same uh, years, uh, going down there initially before uh, Chavez, and then uh, watching Chavez uh, do what he did, and now, of course, Maduro. So, yeah, I've, it, it has been a particular interest to me. So there's, there's these sort of 
Latin American-wide struggles with authoritarianism in general. What do you think are, are the sort of common threads between what's going on in Nicaragua today and, and Venezuela, in addition to that sort of authoritarian sort of strongman issue? Well, it is the playing with the socialist ideology. Uh, it is the notion, of course, the strongman motif exists not just in Latin America, yes. but, but particularly in Latin America. And the, the playing with various kinds of Marxist ideas uh, with Nicaragua is more explicitly liberation theology under the Venezuelan dictatorships of Chavez and Maduro. It's less so. They've been more openly uh, antagonistic toward the church. But nonetheless, the themes of liberation theology, the amalgamation of Marxism with uh, Christian and particularly Catholic sentiments and categories uh, give us a real parallel. And then you see what's actually happening, the tampering with the elections, the buying off of people, the dependency upon uh, Cuban sponsorship. Yes, uh, I remember when I was first in Nicaragua in 1990, hearing about the doctors that had been sent and the formation of neighborhood watch groups that were formed in, in imitation to the uh, Cuban watch groups and that were formed in Nicaragua, and now uh, the same thing that exists in, in Venezuela. So there are a lot of parallels here. Yeah. So there's, there's some grounding in liberation theology. Yeah. The church has, has pushed back against that historically. And Pope Francis mentioned uh, in his Christmas message, he called attention to both the situations in Venezuela and in Nicaragua. I'm just going to quote a couple of lines from that Christmas message on Venezuela. May this blessed season allow Venezuela once more to recover social harmony and enable all the members of society to work fraternally for the country's development and to aid the most vulnerable sectors of the population. And then later on Nicaragua, before the child Jesus, may the inhabitants of beloved Nicaragua see themselves once more as brothers and sisters so that divisions and discord will not prevail, but all may work to promote reconciliation and to build together the future of the country." Uh, end quote. Are you encouraged by the Pope's message here? And what else would you like to see and hear from Pope Francis on, on these recent developments? Well, let me be frank. I, I think these are nice sentiments. They're good sentiments. certainly true that there should be reconciliation and love and mutual respect and all the rest of it. But I think they are weak. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the Holy Father appears to be quite intent not to take the side of people who are being oppressed. Uh, it is very clear in both Nicaragua and in Venezuela, and, and their bishops know this as well uh, of these countries, though they have to be much more diplomatic than perhaps I'm being here, yeah. uh, that the oppressors are the uh, socialist-inspired oligarchs, the, the authoritarian regimes. And if this were a case of real oligarchs, uh, people who the Pope might see as pro-capitalist or pro-West, he, I think, would be much more explicit about this. The Pope has a history, having grown up in Latin America, of seeing all business as part and parcel of an oppressive regime. Uh, I don't think the, the Holy Father sees a distinction between crony capitalism and free markets. Mm -hmm. And he also had a certain sympathy based on his own experience in Argentina of seeing Marxists being brutalized by the dictatorships that were uh, operating in, in Venezuela at the time. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in Argentina at the time. He had a certain sympathy because he, he knew one of his professors whose daughters whose children were killed, disappeared, and who herself was eventually killed by the, the, the dictatorships, gave him a certain sympathy. Uh, the Holy Father recently said that Christians shouldn't be afraid to be identified as communists. Well, I'm horrified to be identified as a yeah. communist, given, <laughs> given communism's historical record. So mm -hmm. I do think that these statements could be clarified, and ex I know that they would be received very warmly 
by the people of Nicaragua and the people of Venezuela, that is the people who are suffering right now, if the Holy Father said something a little more explicit. Yeah. No. Um, that's certainly something. That's going to gonna cost me my red hat. So oh. there we go. <laughs> I think you lost that a while ago. I think I did, yes. <laughs> um, you recently had a conversation with an old friend of many years, Ricardo Ball, about the ongoing crisis in Venezuela. Um, this is a conversation that we live streamed uh, to an international audience. What are some of the most striking things you've heard from your personal context in Venezuela about the, about the present situation? Well, of course, it's the desperation of the people. I, we had a conference with a group of Venezuelans that we sponsored. We selected um, about 35 or 40 leaders from various sectors. About two days before I left I went to our big box store here, Myers. just began going through the pharmacy and taking big bottles of vitamins and sterile water and alcohol and aspirin and all these kinds of things. It was, uh, you know, just a whole bunch of basic things, fruit juices for kids and protein bars and protein powder and I brought it with me to this conference, and I said to the people, I said, here is the, what I brought in a suitcase. I said, help yourself to it. I even had to bring communion wafers because the priest who came from Nicaragua said, we are short on communion wafers. Now, communion wafers are nothing more than wheat and water as a thin cracker. They were short on those. And so I brought from my own parish, I took several boxes of communion wafers for him to take back to his parish and some boxes of incense for them to use because that's exotic even here a little bit and they were so grateful for those very practical things that they could bring to people and say somebody outside your country uh, is concerned i'm horrified by uh, ricardo ball in fact showed a photo on that broadcast that we did of people digging in a dump truck, a garbage truck, just sorting through it. And I saw subsequent um, video of that where they're not only sorting through it, but they're eating yeah. right there. These people, I think the average uh, Venezuelan has lost about 40 pounds in the last year. This is, you know, when you know people, yeah. <laughs> and you've been down there and you see the thing, it just it breaks your heart. Absolutely. Um, we've had many folks from, from Latin America and from Venezuela in particular attend events at Acton. Um, last Acton University, in yes. fact, we had some people from Venezuela that you sent. I was working uh, in the bookshop there, and you had sent down some students to come, and we you know, loaded them up with books yes. and materials and anything that could help inspire some folks to... Uh, to resist the, the Maduro regime and to press for change. You know what is important, too, about all of this? I mean, there, there's no lack of misery throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Any, anywhere you'd go, uh, you can find me here yeah. in, in our own Absolutely. city. You're going to yeah. find that. What is particularly important, and I think the reason institutionally the Acton Institute wants to underscore this, is that it is a lesson in what socialism does, there has been a concerted effort on the part of the left to disassociate themselves now from a regime that they were very supportive of Absolutely. Uh, early on. I'm talking Bernie Sanders. I'm talking about Sean Penn. I'm Noam talking Chomsky. About Noam Chomsky. All of these people who identified with this regime saying how wonderful it is, what they're seeing going on down there. This is under mm -hmm. Chavez and even Maduro. Uh, and now they want to back away from it. And, and I think institutionally what we want to do is say, no, we want to wrap this around your neck. You need to understand that the ideas that you are propagating, uh, whether it's policies with regard to what should be going on in Latin America or, or South America or, or Central America, or what you're trying to get the American public to buy into, these kinds of ideas result in these kinds of desperate situations when taken far enough. The problem with the Maduro regime isn't that it isn't real socialism. It's that it taken socialism very seriously. 
And this is what happens. And not just in Latin America. But everywhere we've seen these experiments, the shortages, the, the kind of brutality, the lack of freedom of travel or freedom of speech, all of these things mm -hmm. need to be tied to these regimes that see the government as the dominant actor in human society. Yeah. And there needs to be a religious and a moral foundation right. to that response. Exactly. Um, exactly. Although there are religious people. Pope Francis recently lifted, for instance, the canonical penalties imposed by Pope John Paul II on Father Ernesto Cardinal in 1984. Who was Father Cardinal, and, and why were these original penalties imposed? This was a, a Nicaraguan this priest. This is a Nicaraguan priest, uh, Father Ernesto Cardinal. i am forgotten what order he was. I, he was... Um is he a Carmelite or a, a I, Franciscan or? I know he. I know he went. His for brother a while. was a Jesuit. Yes, his, his brother, brother was, was a, a Jesuit. Jesuit, and for a while he was at the monastery that Thomas Merton was at in Kentucky. So, in his so youth. maybe he was Benedictine or uh, of that tradition. So Cardinal had this little island group. Uh, retreat place, kind of mm -hmm. a monastery type thing where he'd bring people in. And there's there's a whole book of dialogue of him teaching them. And yeah. it was a blatant effort to eisegete. Eisegesis is the opposite of exegesis. Exegesis mm -hmm. is when you read scripture and draw out from the text the meaning of the text. Eisegesis is when you read into scripture. And a classic example of reading Marxist analysis into the scriptures. And this is what he did. He became cultural minister for the Sandinistas, was quite defiant of uh, the warnings and the admonitions of the Holy See to him during this period of time uh, where the Sandinistas were coming into power and was told explicitly, and this is in canon law, that priests cannot serve in, uh, uh, in governmental positions. Yeah. And this happened here in the United States. There was mm -hmm. a famous case of Father Drynan. From who, Massachusetts. From Massachusetts. Uh, it's the seat that uh, Barney Frank held subsequently. Mm -hmm. And he was told to remove himself from that position. He did. Cardinal said no and showed up at the airport when the Holy Father, when John Paul II came to Nicaragua mm -hmm. and w was on the greeting line and knelt and that's the famous photograph oh, yeah. of the Holy Father saying to him, get yourself right with the church. Get your standing right with you. You made certain vows of obedience. Now we're holding, the, holding you to those vows that you made freely. And so he was suspended. We call it in canon law, a divinus. And so until now, he's an old man. I actually confess, I thought he had died. Yeah. Uh, he's an old man and... Uh, is a very generous act on the part of Pope Francis to restore him before he died so that he could celebrate Mass once again. Although Cardinal had said he wasn't interested in yeah. celebrating Mass anymore. I don't know how a priest does that. You know, if, you, you know, <laughs> if you're a priest, this is your, your lifeblood. It's your identity. But in any event, he accepted mm -hmm. the uh, offer of the Pope. I really wish the Pope would clarify, you know, he's not endorsing the Sandinista project at all, but in any event, that's that's what happened. Daniel Ortega, who was the Sandinista who uh, Father Cardinal had served as uh, the cultural, cultural minister, minister for, yeah. is in power again in Nicaragua. Amazing. And this is and this is part of part of the issue. His daughter, by the way, you know, accused him of child abuse. Yes, sexual abuse. I had heard that and she had to flee the country, she as did. I understand. Yeah. She did. No, it's a it's a sorry situation. What can you tell us about that crisis in Nicaragua at which Ortega is sort of at the center? Right at the beginning of the Acton Institute. In fact, uh, uh, interestingly enough, my, the first article I ever published in the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. was called um, The Sandinistas Faithful Pilgrims. I think that was the name of it in 1990. Yep. I remember that not only because it was the first article I ever published in the Wall Street Journal, but it was the first submission of any article I ever had by, by means of a fax machine. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and that's available, I'm sure, on our website or on the Wall Street Journal yeah. website. It was just right at the, uh, the time of the elections that were going on mm -hmm. down there. And I had already been to Guatemala, as I had said, and uh, I planned to 
go to Nicaragua, and I arranged with some friends to meet me from the Universidad uh, Francisco Marroquin. Mm -hmm. uh, I stopped in Guatemala, and they met me at the airport with a box of books. I said, I need Spanish books mm -hmm. on the free economy. Yes. And so they gave me a whole box of books. Uh, I had The Wealth of Nations. I had uh, Bastiat's The Law. And there were, uh, it was jammed full with this Reader's Digest, Spanish Reader's Digest version of Friedrich Hayek's The Road to Serfdom. Mm -hmm. And so these were all in the box. And I also brought a whole suitcase full. Again, you know, I, this is where I, yeah. I did it. I just packed a suitcase full of various kinds of medicines mm -hmm. that I had gotten from doctors here who had given me these medicines uh, to give because I knew I was going to be meeting some of the Carmelite sisters down there who who ran a clinic. And so I had this big suitcase full of drugs, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> in effect, <laughs> uh, and a box full of books. And I, I carried whatever I needed personally uh, on my person. And when I got from Guatemala picking up the books into Nicaragua, I was stopped by the customs agent. It was a young man. I, I don't think he was maybe of college age. And he said to me, um, what's in that suitcase? I said, they're drugs that I'm bringing for the medicines for the sisters who run the Carmelite clinic. And he said, okay, what's in the box? And I said, some books. Yeah. And he was interested in the books. Mm -hmm. He wasn't interested in looking at the, the medicines, <laughs> yeah. the drugs. He was interested in looking at the books. And yeah. I said, uh, okay. And I thought, well, this is, this ends my trip to mm -hmm. Nicaragua. Yeah. So I opened the box and sitting on top was this little, abbreviated version of the road to serfdom mm -hmm. and he picked it up and he saw road to serfdom this is of course all in yeah. spanish and he flipped open to the front page the dedication page. oh yes now a lot of people aren't going to know who hayek dedicated the road to serfdom mm -hmm. to but it, there it was in spanish why don't you tell us it's, dan you're, it's, you're uh, a great research yeah. guy it's to uh to socialists of all parties that's exactly right <laughs> to the socialists of all parties and he looked at that and looked at me and smiled. <laughs> and he said, can I have this? I said, absolutely. But I suspected that he wouldn't have had the educational background. I was just, a, some, I surmised this on, on my own. So I pulled out The Law by Bastiat, which is yeah. a much simpler book. And mm -hmm. I said, why don't you take this too? Yeah. Because I think we'll will help you. And I wrapped up my box, grabbed my drugs, and ran out of the airport <laughs> <laughs> and went to stay at the home of a, a bishop in the area yeah. who was the pastor that time of a little parish in Belo Horizonte, which is one of the um, neighborhoods of Managua, who is now the Cardinal Archbishop of, uh, of Managua. Oh, yeah. And uh, that was... I don't know if that was my first, that was, I think, my second visit okay. to Nicaragua. Yeah. What should, what should the attitude and sort of response of Christians in other countries, in places like the United States in particular, be to these sort of man-made crises? Well, I think, you know, the first thing that Christians and, and any moral person needs to do, any thinking person needs to do, is just look at these things dispassionately, not through an ideological lens. I think... We all have our philosophies. I mean, I certainly believe, and I think I, uh, it's based on my study uh, of history and economics, but just to look at really what's happening, I'm not afraid to criticize the United States when I see its excessive intervention either in our own economy or, mm -hmm. and this is part of the problem yes. with Latin America, that we've intervene, intervened many, many times in these various economies to put in the people that the American administration at the time wanted. Mm -hmm. And you could make the case uh, as to why that is better or worse, but I think sometimes it's been worse. And what is worse about it isn't just those particular instances, but the whole frame of reference in the Latin American mind that America is not our friend. America wants to own us. Mm -hmm. And I think to the extent that our policies have done that, 
we have to disown that. We have to critique that. I I think it's the same thing with Christians today. We need to look at, at the reality that not everybody who says they're on the side of the downtrodden and the oppressed and the poor are on their side. And this is certainly the case with the Sandinistas in Nicaragua and the uh, Chavistas in Venezuela. And God knows the whole experiment in in Cuba, which has, of course, a a longer track record of oppression and of defying human rights on this continent. Well, Father Robert, thank you so much for for joining me and and talking about uh, your considerable experience in Latin America. sharing that with our listeners. Thank you. Is it just a pleasure to do it? Thank you. Acting University is not your typical conference. It's a four-day celebration with 1,000 of your newest liberty-loving friends from all over the world. Each day is packed with thought-provoking presentations on the foundations of a free society. Expand your worldview and explore theology, business, market-based economics, and much more at the most unique conference in the Liberty Movement. To apply, visit university.acton.org. We've all heard about Venezuela in the news, about how President Maduro has overseen the dissolution of both the high courts and parliament, and how 25,000% inflation racks the country. But what is it like to live there? I spoke with Javier Avila, a Venezuelan political dissident who presented a bleak picture of the view from the ground. My hometown, Maracaibo, they're suffering right now uh, electricity shortages of about seven, uh, eight, or even 12 hours a day, or even more, it depends, because they they didn't care about investing in infrastructure that enables energy to, to go to Maracaibo. This kind of happens in many other issues like water, business conditions, there are not good regulations. People is just more like trying to survive uh, while they are just getting uh, poorer and poorer. So it's a quite harsh context where you have not, not only corporal sufferings but also mental sufferings because you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel and that ultimately can affect your spirit. The Venezuelan spirit was a theme which animated our conversation, with Javier alternating between feelings of despair for the current state of Venezuela and hope for its future. He gave one especially vivid example of a common scene from his homeland. And when you go, for example, uh, traveling uh, in the public transports, you have the metro. It's a quite harsh place because you see an impressive amount of people that have great tumors or that they are totally blind or they have a bacteria that is actually consuming in the the moment, asking for food or for money so they can purchase the medicines they require. But the economic conditions are so hard that even the means of giving aid, that is the cash, due to hyperinflation, it doesn't have any value. So they need to work harder in order to get more bills from Venezuela so that they can provide themselves their medicines. These stories from Javier aren't proof of some type of hatred he holds for his country. On the contrary, I have rarely met anyone so patriotic. Javier clearly loves Venezuela, but his frustration stems from its current management. There's a struggle for power in which the players are very weak and they are getting weaker. They're just falling with the country. So the thing is that you need to be the strongest of the weaker. Now, Maduro's government controls the oil company PDVSA. You might not know it, but you have probably bought gas from PDVSA because it has total ownership of U.S. gas giant Citgo. The average Venezuelan citizen is almost completely dependent on the fortunes of this one company, which accounts for over 90% of Venezuela's exports. People is just like trying to struggle. They, they know that, that uh, it is fall of the yeah. government but they actually are still dependent on the government for feed themselves or for having any kind of service. With less than a quarter of Venezuelans in support, Nicolas Maduro's government is able to stay in power in part because it bribes its citizens with food. The Wall Street Journal reported that, during the last election, pro-Maduro voters could use their fatherland cards to pick up food at polling stations. The socialist government not only takes advantage of its citizens' hardship, but also has partially caused the brutal situation. Maduro allows his citizens very little freedom, 
including in the market. The business environment has uh, changed a lot uh, with this because regularly they had like a lot of space, but right now there is a law that it is not fully accomplished, but there is a law that says you that you cannot have a profit margin above 30% of what it really costs you to produce it. Restricting profit margins to 30% is a reflection of the labor theory of value, a now defunct economic theory which says that the value of a good is based on the labor invested into it. In reality, the value of a good is dependent on its value to consumers. Restrictions on profit margins remove incentives for businessmen to create value for consumers. Javier explained how the restrictions on legal business operations have caused many businessmen to move to the black market. Black markets are more vulnerable to abuses and violence because they lack any structure or court systems to support fair business practices. Economic and political oppression has prompted many like Javier to advocate against Maduro's government. Javier played a part in the 2017 Venezuelan protests, which were catalyzed mainly by students and focused on the capital city, Caracas. He described the aim of these protests. Basically, the goals were to apply uh, an immense amount of pressure in order to um, overthrow the government. And every time we went out to the streets, it was a total battle against the government forces that just have the capability of oppression by tear gases or uh, water jets in trucks. Sometimes they actually use uh, weapons. And every protest was uh, crashing with an impenetrable wall that was protecting power. On June 7th of last year, Neymar Lander, a 17-year-old student, was killed during the protests of Nicolas Maduro's election. That evening, protesters marched in a vigil to honor him. Javier played a central role in the march that day. I remember one day in particular, the day before I received a shield with the Virgin Mary over it. It was a large shield, a rectangle shield, like a meter times 50 centimeters more yeah. or less. And the image was so beautiful and was so symbolical that I really realized what impact I was going to create the day after. The day they gave it to me, they killed uh, Neil Marlander, who was a 17-year-old student from the resistance. And the day after, I went out with that shield at night in a, we can call it like vigilia, like a night protest just for giving our prayers to the soul of Neymar. So I actually went out with it and I realized that people, it wasn't me, it was the shield that they were looking at. And they were like thanking me that I carried the Virgin. Then I get together with some nuns that began to pray the Rosario. Yeah. Suddenly, the whole march just get behind us because we were forming a line which uh, was, the Virgin was in the center. As we, we began to, to, to march, it was a beautiful march at night with candles. And you actually feel all the suffering and all the hope that the people was holding on those protests. When we get to the top of the march that day, uh, there were some guys that in a truck full of headphones, they just began to to express their feelings and to accuse the people for not fighting hardly as they have been fighting. And that's true, but it's also true that those people were all people, uh, mothers, kids, that were providing them food uh, or any kind of equipment like helmets and, and masks in order that they can be able to fight because not everyone is made to fight those fierce battles that, that, that are totally surrealistic. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, well, I've never been in a public speech, but I realized that the best thing that I was able to do and I was entitled to do since I was having like a good symbol and people were following me yeah. or looking at me like, like a symbol. So here is Javier standing with a group of nuns at the front of the march and holding a shield painted with the Virgin Mary. He hears some protesters berating those marching for not being dedicated enough to the cause. Since he has the shield and is a symbol of the march, he runs up to the truck and climbs on top of it. He takes the microphone and begins to encourage those marching. I just tried to connect with people and to tell them really what they were worth, that, that, that this is a really a battle for human dignity. This is a battle for, for, for our future. This is a battle for, for getting our medicines and, 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 and well and, and all the goods that we deserve. And 
each one of us got a role and uh, it wasn't necessary that we all were there like brutally fighting but what was necessary was that we stand every day on the street until the, the government is overthrown. He affirms the God-given dignity of those marching, telling them to keep working and to have hope. But he also knows this hope is fragile. I mean, it was really beautiful because, because all the family, all the churches, all the, the civil society was involved in the cause. Sadly, what happened was that eventually uh, it didn't last that long. People began to lose hope because the government was really holding on. And uh, at the end, what broke everything apart was that one of the main opposition leaders decided to participate in elections for governors. And it was well known that the electoral referee in Venezuela is ideological and political controlled by the government. I asked Javier what the shield he carried in the march symbolized to him. It was kind of realizing that I was really part of a community. And, um, and, and I was really part not only of a Catholic community, but also of a country with some level of, of diversity. But it, 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 marked, it marked me in some way that I realized that I need to keep going on. I cannot give them the benefit uh, or the pleasure of giving myself up because if I give myself up, they win. What matters to Javier is the Venezuelan people. His shield was the incredible hope he holds for his country, and he is marked by that hope to continue fighting. To me, Javier is also a symbol, a symbol of resilience and the human creativity that could be realized in Venezuela. But his story is also a symbol of how fragile the situation is. Javier plans to return to Venezuela. He loves his country and wants to be back with his family, but he worries that he won't be able to return to his university this fall and wonders what life will be like in the future. Thank you for listening today. I hope you enjoy this episode. We're always trying to make a great show for you. And one of the ways in which we can do that is to use feedback from you. We would love to hear from you. Whether you'd like to suggest a specific guest or topic, let us know what you like or dislike in our shows, or just generally let us know why you like listening. You can shoot us an email at actinline at actin.org. In addition to that, we're trying to create a new occasional segment for the show. If you have any questions related to a subject we've covered on this podcast before, or questions related to economics, faith, business, or maybe a current issue you'd like to hear discussed on the podcast, leave us a message at 888-705-4180. If your question is picked, you'll get to hear it on the show, and members of our team here at the Acton Institute will break it down on the podcast. Last but definitely not least, if you like Act In Line, please subscribe today. And don't forget to share it with your friends or family members who might also enjoy listening to this podcast. We're available on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. This episode is produced by me, Caroline Roberts, with audio mixing by Doug Nagel. 